Tonight I'm going to talk about El Nino and wind on the water, but I'm going to also tie this in a little bit to the greater science that we do um, at Mauna Kea, which is astronomy. Today I would like to thank the Keck Observatory for making it possible for me to be here. And I actually enjoy doing this, so the fact that it's my birthday is a pleasure. I'm going to talk about the special role of water in weather and climate, uh, El Nino, hurricanes improving forecasts, and future storms. So a little bit about climate in the future. And this is a photograph taken by the Cassini uh, satellite in the vicinity of Saturn looking back at the planet Earth. And you can see that Earth has a beautiful color. And if we look a little closer, we know that Earth has a beautiful color. Um, I would love to take a ride out into space if it was not so expensive and dangerous to see this, you know, live. Uh, but astro uh, astronauts have, and, and they all come back changed. <clears throat> We live on this planet, and this planet is a speck in the universe. And it's a blue speck. I want you to look closely at this planet, or maybe blur your eyes a little bit, and think of the color that you see. There's actually a couple of colors. Um, there is the blue of the ocean, and then uh, if you look over land, there's a lot of vegetation, and the vegetation reflects a lot of red. The Earth has a very special signature when you're out in space. If you're at Saturn and you're looking back with, its, with a powerful telescope at Earth and you look at the individual wavelengths for Earth, what you see is that you have lots of oxygen and you have a lot of water and uh, you have uh, ultraviolet uh, radiation that is uh, being uh, reflected back by, or absorbed from, by ozone. And then in addition, you've got vegetation, which is reflecting red. And so on one side, you've got a lot of blue. And on the other side of the visible spectrum, you've got a lot of red. And if you have a powerful telescope looking at Earth from far away, that's a very distinctive uh, signature that it has in, in the spectra. And so wouldn't it be interesting to have a super powerful telescope to be looking at worlds across space nearby that could show a similar signature because it would tell us uh, the possibility that there might be life elsewhere in the universe. It's a little bit of an aside, but that's my tie-in to the Keck Observatory. Why does water take so much energy to evaporate. If you have a, a liter of water or a gallon of water on the stove and you want to evaporate the whole thing away, it takes a long time and it takes a lot of energy. And the question is why? And it turns out that the reason is because there are, uh, there's sort of an asymmetric distribution of charge in these molecules, in the water molecule. Each of these is a water molecule, and it's an asymmetric distribution of charge, which allows there to be an attraction between the water molecules. That attraction creates little bonds, and those bonds have a name. They're called hydrogen bonds. It's breaking those bonds that allows water to go from liquid to vapor, breaking the hydrogen bonds. And, uh, there's a tremendous amount of energy involved in that. It's hidden energy, and we call that latent heat. <clears throat> so hidden energy that's used to break the balance between water molecules to allow to wa the water to evaporate, uh, it takes a lot of energy. Conversely, as the water condenses in a cloud, that energy comes back. It's released into the air, and that provides buoyancy, fuel, if you will, uh, to, that allows the, uh, a, a storm to, to gain energy. And I have here a tornado, and here is a hurricane. You can see all the water. This is radar looking uh, at a tremendous amount of precipitation taking place in the eye wall of this hurricane. And so it's that energy from uh, the water vapor condensing 
that is providing the fuel for these storms. This is a global view of the water vapor in the atmosphere and also the precipitation. The water vapor is in white and the precipitation is in orange. And if you look at this global picture, what do you see? You see that there's a lot of water vapor near the equator. And the reason for that is that it's easier for water to evaporate when the, the water, the liquid water, is at a higher temperature. Higher temperature allows for more water vapor to evaporate. And so the warmest ocean is near the equator, because that's where the sun beats down the most, and that's where most of the water vapor is. And then the water vapor moves north, and where it turns orange, it's precipitating. As it's moving northward, it kind of rises up in clouds and storms, and it precipitates out. And there's a link, Hawaii's over here somewhere, and there's kind of a link, as you can see, where the water vapor comes by Hawaii, and then it, it streams up into the west coast and produces flooding, and they refer to that as the Pineapple Express. What does El Nino have to do with water vapor? Well, El Nino is warm water at the equator, and this is a picture of anomalous warm water over the equator from this past winter. This is January of this year, 2016, and you can see quite a lot of, uh, of warm, anomalous temperature. And it's right along the equator, which is kind of interesting. So if somebody asks you, what is El Nino? It's an anomalous amount of warm water parked along the equator. It has an impact because of the, the tendency then for water vapor to be evaporating. This is the water vapor. This is last summer, actually. And I'll come back to this slide a little later uh, again. But it's moisture in the air. Amount of water vapor relates directly to the sea surface temperature. There's that signature from uh, El Nino. So they have a big blob of warmth there, moisture. To answer the question, why do we care about El Nino, Here's the answer. Every few years, we get this anomaly, and it alter, alters the weather patterns globally. And large ecosystem impacts result, and they have economic losses tied to them. And there's a relatively long time scale for El Nino. It, it lasts for months, and you can kind of see it developing, and it has a characteristic sort of signature. And because of that, you can start doing seasonal pred prediction, and that has uh, real important economic implications too. This is a picture of the sea surface temperature for El Nino at the top and La Nina at the bottom. This is in the 1997-98 El Nino, which was the previous strongest El Nino to the one we're just having now. And, and this is the following year, it was followed by cooler temperatures. Now, you might say, well, this doesn't look the same as the signature that I showed before. It's a little different because this is the actual sea surface temperature, and before I was showing the anomaly. So you subtract the climato climatology from the actual, and you get the anomaly. The atmosphere really cares about what the sea surface temperature actually is. And so this is important because this area here, which is just south of Hawaii, Hawaii is here, this area, is very warm, and it, it, thunderstorms tend to form there. Animation I'm showing here is the Hadley circulation. It, it's actually a, a loop uh, taken from my house, a and what it's showing is northeast trade winds at the low levels, and aloft at the upper levels is southwesterlies. And it turns out that this is actually part of the same circulation. You have low-level flow going toward the equator. It runs into the, where the hot water is, and it goes up into thunderstorms. And at the tops of the thunderstorms, you get a little moisture that comes out, and it produces these clouds at high levels that come back the other way. This is a very characteristic pattern for the Hawaiian Islands. And if you um, <clears throat> go outside on, on any particular day, uh, and look at the low-level clouds and the high-level clouds and really watch them, you'll get this, this view is very, very common. And here's a, 
kind of a schematic to, to put that into perspective for the, for the globe. This is a, uh, an idealized cartoon of the weather machine. And you can see that there's rising uh, motion near the equator, and then it rises up and moves to the north. This is the southwesterlies, and then it returns back to the equator, and those are the trade winds. And so the Hawaiian Islands are right here. You can see the northeast trades with high pressure to the north, and you have cloudiness and, and, uh, and deep convection at the equator. El Nino enhances the Hadley circulation, it makes it stronger. Here's the line of thunderstorms on the equator that's characteristic of, of our you know, global circulation. It's that uh, thunder, line of thunderstorms, and then, then you have a loft uh, air moving towards the pole. It sinks, and then it comes back to the equator as northeast trades, and that's the Hadley circulation. And this line of thunderstorms here actually goes all the way around the globe, and it moves north and south with the sun. And so you can see over Africa um, in the summertime, you have a little bit more precipitation in the Sahel, and in the wintertime, it moves south over the Congo. And similarly, India has a monsoon in the summertime, and then it has dry conditions in the winter. And Northern Australia has a wind, uh, it's their summer, of course, our winter, has a monsoon in January. And then across the Pacific, it doesn't change much. That line just sits right where it is, and that's the thing that helps drive our prevailing trade winds. So this is an animation of how an El Nino forms, the, the anomaly pattern. And you can see that it's building here. This is an El Nino of 1982, and this is the 1998 one. But notice that at the end, um, it cools off, and you get this cool pattern afterwards. That cool pattern is La Nina. So El Nino is followed by La Nina. And I want to talk a little bit about what the consequences are of El Nino and La Nina uh, anomalies. So here's the uh, pattern for El Nino. And notice that at the equator, the winds are relatively light here, and they're actually blowing uh, from the west a little bit. And what happens is the sea surface temperature warms up a lot when the winds are light. And there's no upwelling in, in this case, in this area. There's no upwelling. So the, the sea surface is not getting replenished with cool, nutrient-rich waters, if you will. And as a result, you get heavy precipitation. So this precipitation is right in here. This is the Hawaiian Islands here. And then you can see the Hawaiian Islands again. And you can see the heavy precipitation anomaly. And at the same time, uh, over Indonesia, you have unusually dry conditions. And El Nino, El Nino this year is also producing super dry conditions over Indonesia, and it has resulted in a lot of forest fires there. So what about for Hawaii? What does El Nino do for Hawaii? And it, it turns out that the blue is El Nino, and it produces this kind of a signature where in the late summer and fall, you get more precipitation. And then come around November and then all the way through March, you have very anomalously dry conditions. And I think that we can all agree that this last winter has been very dry in the Hawaiian Islands. It, it certainly has been dry on Oahu. In fact, yesterday I was uh, climbing Diamond Head, walking up Diamond Head, and uh, there was a, a forest, well, not a forest fire, a brush fire on the slope going up to some of the houses on the ridge, the Halikoa Ridge. And it's very typical that that would happen during an El Nino year to have fires uh, on the ridge lines that never ordinarily occur this time of year because after the winter rains, there's normally uh, plenty of moisture in the soil. If you look at the La Nina pattern, it's a very wet one. And El Nino is followed by La Nina. So next winter, we're expecting to see quite a lot of precipitation. But when's that going to happen? As you can see, the summer after El Nino is a rather dry one, all the way through October, super dry. So it looks like we're going to be experiencing drought through the summer. With The only exception to that could be if we get hit by some tropical storms, which I'll get to later. And, and then um, it becomes rather wet starting in November. That's Kona Low season. 
Let's see how that works. Well, for one thing, El Nino affects the jet stream. This is at the level that jets fly, and it creates an anomalous pattern so that you have a jet north of Hawaii that goes right into California, and California tends to get floods during El Nino. It turns out that the, the flooding was a little farther north this year. It tended to hit Seattle and uh, hit Washington. They had record rainfall this winter in Washington state. But Northern California also had heavy rains, and all of the reservoirs in Northern California are completely full, which is super because last year they were co almost completely empty. Sea surface temperature anomalies are causing waves in the jet stream, and the, and the jet stream controls where the storms go. And that's the connection. So for Hawaii, uh, during El Nino, uh, here's Hawaii. It's a little hard to see. But there's strong northwesterly winds and then uh, strong southwesterly winds into California. That's the, that's the anomaly pattern. And so you get moist air coming into the west coast with uh, flooding. And we get very large swell from this very strong low that centers just to the north of us. It kind of comes, it, 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 the lows uh, kind of do a merry-go-round thing from uh, Japan and Kamchatka. They just go around this way, and, and uh, they produce these tremendous uh, swells. So we have super big waves, and we had the Eddie Aikau this winter, um, and it was really quite exciting. Next winter, the, the La Nina winter, is going to be different because what we get then, instead of um, uh, strong, lar large waves, we get southerly flow that's pretty strong over the Hawaiian Islands and low pressure. That's a Kona low, so we get Kona lows here. Um, in this case, in the El Nino case, there's actually almost no wind over Hawaii because the ridge is right on top of us, which makes it very dry. So the, uh, this last winter was very dry. Next winter, with strong southerly flow expected at times from Kona lows, we're going to see some heavy, heavy precipitation. Meanwhile, west coast, northwesterly winds, snow for Seattle. Let's take a look at some pictures here. This is uh, the Big Island on the uh, leeward side, Waikoloa area. Uh, and you can see how dry it is during El Nino. And the conditions during La Nina are, are much wetter. Uh, I had to throw in a slide for epic waves. So this is an animation which shows the current sea surface temperature anomaly. And, and again, it, it's just making the point that we have an El Nino, had an El Nino last winter, and now it's, it's becoming a cold anomaly. See right there at the end? This is uh, May. May is cold. So we're already heading in that direction. The, these are the models. We modeled the sea surface temperature with, uh, sea, uh, with atmosphere, ocean coupled models. And uh, all of the models are taking the, the warm temperature anomaly that we had and bringing it way down. What does this have to do with all those tropical cyclones we had last year? We had three Category 4 hurricanes um, uh, last summer at the same time. It was a first. And we had 15 cyclones, which was also an unprecedented occurrence. Um, and this is just a kind of collage that was put together by a hydrologist at the National Weather Service. I think it makes a great image. And notice that we have this big hole over the Hawaiian Islands. <clears throat> he kind of did that. I mean, the, 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 the hurricanes actually got pretty darn close. And if he wanted to, he could have covered this all with cloud if he, if he wanted to. But the fact of the matter is, we got lucky. None of them hit us. And part of that's because we're a relatively small target. But with so many uh, tropical cyclones uh, rumbling around, it's, it was a small miracle, I think, that we didn't get hit. Why did we have so many hurricanes? Well, this is back to that slide that I showed before. Anomalous water vapor in the air was created by anomalously warm sea surface temperatures that already occurred last summer, because this is for July, last July. That's when all those tropical cyclones were getting going. Again, it's latent heat. It's the amount of water vapor in the air that provides fuel 
for these storms. What about this idea that the Hawaiian Islands are more or less protected from hurricanes by the Big Island? We've got Mauna Kea, we've got Mauna Loa, great places for astronomy. Uh, do they really protect us from tropical storms? We asked that question of um, a Hawaiian language expert, Puakea Nogelmeyer. We gave him some money to fund some research to look for hurricanes in, in the record, in, the, in, the, in all the newspaper accounts. And, and this is what we found, that on August 9th, 1871, a major Category 3 hurricane struck the islands of Hawaii and Maui and produced widespread destruction. <clears throat> so actually this last image I should, I should say is, is of Kauai, so, and the hurricane didn't hit Kauai, but I just like this view because it kind of shows a uh, typical Hawaiian village and you can imagine this village would not do well. I mean, it's, it, it, all, all of the, the covering material would be blown away by the hurricane. But there were a, enough accounts that we could draw this map. And, uh, and this is 7 o'clock in the morning. It's just off of Hilo. This is the eye of the hurricane. It comes across near Honoka'a. Right across Honoka'a at 9 AM is being blown away, folks. Blown away. And then it crosses the saddle, comes out, and goes right up through here. And then Lahaina gets knocked out at 11 AM. How do we know this? Well, because of Hawaiian language newspapers. You can see, I can't read this either. Uh, this is old Hawaiian. And, uh, and it says things like the, the, the wind was like uh, 5,000 steam whistles being set off at once. I mean, there's the, the, the uh, accounts are very graphic and, de and descriptive. And this was published in uh, a few days after the hurricane. It really kind of st struck a, a, a chord in me that the Hawaiians were so prolific and such good observers that we had ability to do this, this research. And, and we're actually doing more research now on tsunamis and uh, uh, droughts and other, other interesting things, including uh, El Nino type uh, research. Using articles out of these papers, the, it turns out that um, there's more Hawaiian language newspaper uh, script pages than any other indigenous uh, peoples in, in the Western Hemisphere. It's really remarkable. The first printing press came to the Hawaiian Islands um, around 1820. And uh, the Ali'i actually had a, had a conference and they, they were deciding whether to, you know, what to do. And they decided that they would allow the printing press to come if the uh, missionaries, the Protestant missionaries, would teach the Ali'i how to read and write. And so there was a core of these Ali'i that uh, formed a class. And they created, with the help of the Portuguese, but, but the Hawaiians really created this, this language, uh, this phonetics for the Hawaiian language. And then they published a book that taught them how to spell and how to read. And they, they printed 120,000 of these books in a very, very short period. Uh, by you know, 1829. King Kamehameha III was really a driving force behind this, and he, he decreed that there was going to be a school every five, five miles along the coast of all the islands where most of the people lived. And so he had 1,103 schoolhouses built over the period of about 20 years. So the literacy cl cl uh, climbed from near zero around 1820 to 95% literacy by mid-century. So in one generation, uh, they, they created a, a, a modern miracle, I think. And let me say one more thing here. Uh, King Kalakaua was very fascinated by Western science. And he knew that there was going to be a, uh, a transit of Venus across the sun. And that it was 
by measuring very carefully the transit of Venus across the sun, it could say something about the distance from the Earth to the sun and the size of the solar system. Very interesting uh, astronomy at that time. And King Kalakaua said, I want to have a telescope and I want to, I want to watch this. I want to, I want to have scientists here be working on this problem. And then he, he gave the telescope to uh, Punahou. And so there's, a, there's really an interesting uh, history of the Hawaiian ali'i being very fascinated by astronomy. So now I'm going to get back to weather here for a second and talk a little bit about not uh, near-term weather, but future weather, really future weather. And this is a, an animation which shows uh, the distribution of summer temperatures over the United States from 1950 to 2011. And what it shows is that um, the distribution, which, which is sort of a Gaussian distribution, with most, these are the normal temperatures in 1950, and these are the normal temperatures now. But what it also shows is that the coldest temperatures are still there. You still have these amazing cold outbreaks taking place, but the warm records that are being set far, far outweigh anything that's happening on the cold side. But it's been a whole shift in the climate. These are summer temperatures. And I want to show you another animation. This is a different way of looking at it. Um, and on the outside, you'll see uh, the months of the year. And then, and then what you'll see in the animation, let me run it now, is from 1850s to uh, current. And so you can see that these are the temperatures. And they grow a little bit warmer. They kind of stall out there for a minute. And then when it comes to the last few years, it's really uh, remarkably doing quite a lot more. That's 1.5 degrees. We're trying to keep it under 1.5. I don't think we're doing too good. Uh, so this is a, a, another way of looking at that same diagram in a sense with a kind of a running mean through it from the 1800s through uh, currently. And, and this is the monthly temperature for, this, for this, this past February. It turns out that the last 12 months have been the warmest on record for those months, every month for the past 12 months. Now, now part of that has to do with El Nino, actually, because when you have a very large expanse of the Pacific Ocean that is really warm, it contributes to the warmer surface temperature on a global basis. And so there is some variability in the global uh, temperature based on what's going on uh, with the ocean. This is the... Uh, the carbon dioxide, uh, as it's uh, being released, it's the mean annual growth rate of c carbon dioxide at, at Mauna Loa. Uh, and as you can see, that we haven't gotten to the point where it's not growing. This is uh, the February uh, anomaly. And what it shows is, is that most of the warmth, the crazy warmth, was uh, at high latitude. And there's, you know, le it was warmer than average here as well. Uh, but not nearly as much as, as at higher latitude. But it, a little bit of warming, and here you can see the El Nino signature, but a little bit of warming in tropical latitudes actually does more damage because the annual cycle is less. There's much less variation from summer to winter, and so the plants and animals, they can't escape, and they're not used to it. So where is the warming going? the warming from the fact that we have more greenhouse gas in the atmosphere and so we have more radiation coming back to Earth, most of it's going into the ocean, it turns out. The atmosphere is showing a little bit of warming. And the ocean is getting most of it. The ocean has tremendous amount of heat capacity because of the hydrogen bonds. The same reason we have large latent heat makes the ocean have a large heat capacity. And so the ocean is, is warming, but very slowly. 
But we can see it, we can measure it from satellite, and there is a signal. The question is, what might that do? One of the things that we uh, atmospheric scientists who have been studying hurricanes have noticed is that the latitude uh, on the planet where hurricanes res uh, achieve their maximum intensity is moving poleward. Normally, uh, hurricanes, the, their, their maximum intensity, are traveling south of the Hawaiian Islands. When we have uh, hurricanes in the Pacific, they tend to travel south of the Hawaiian Islands. However, if this latitude of maximum intensity is starting to move northward and they're starting to form further north, that means that the amount of hurricanes that Hawaii will see in the future is going to increase. And that's what the climate models are indicating uh, that when we look at this question. So a couple more hurricanes per hurricane season. Maybe, maybe it doesn't sound like a lot, but when we only get you know, three or four uh, during a good year, adding a couple to that means a 50% increase in hurricane threat. Now, what about how people are thinking about global warming? It, it turns out that uh, there was a period here where, uh, in the United States at least, it almost got to 50-50, where half the people were saying, ah, I don't believe in global warming. I'm voting for Trump. They're turning around, and I think more and more people are realizing that uh, the planet is getting warmer because it's getting warmer. You can feel it, right? What can we do about that? Well, there's lots of things we can do about that. My, this, is, this is what my son and I put uh, together. We're, we're fighting about it now. Uh, we put down money on a, on a new Tesla. You, a down payment, right? It's $1,000. You put it down, and, and then you're in line to deliver when, when it gets delivered. It's 35 k which is a ton of money for a car. <clears throat> uh, but it's a statement for me. Um, but then again, my, bro my, my son will probably get the car, and, and this is what I'm going to be riding. A bike, which is the best thing you can do if, if it's not too hilly, and if you can get to the store on a bike, that's the way to go. Of course, you have to find your bike. Sea level rise, of course, is, a, is an issue. And I took this photograph during some of these big wave events. When you have big wave events driven by El Nino along with a bit of sea level rise, even if it's only you know, millimeters per year, eventually it produces these uh, uh, extreme events that cause damage and coastal erosion. And I think that's my last slide. I think if you want a very comfortable chair, you just find an iceberg and relax. Thank you very much.